The Melba Story. The story of Australia's most famous woman. The true story, fully authenticated, and featuring another wonderful Australian singer, Glenda Raymond. The Melba Story, featuring in this chapter, Mobile Quest finalist, Edwin Liddell. At the beginning of 1894, during her first American tour, Melba visited Chicago, where she appeared in Romeo and Juliet with the great Jean de Resque. In the middle of a duet, there was a sudden buzz of excitement. The orchestra stopped playing, and the singers looked at each other in bewilderment. John! John! What is it? What's happened? I do not know, Nelly. The orchestra has stopped playing, and the house is in an uproar. Ah! Look! There's a man climbing over the footlights. He is mad. He is glaring at me. He's glaring at me. Yes, you. You, Madame Melba. I'm going to kill you with my bare hands. John! Keep back, my friend. Oh, no! <laughs> Why do you want to kill him? You left me for another man. What? But he's not going to have you. Nobody's going to have you. <laughs> Help me. He's got a knife. Yeah. Careful. He has a knife. I'll kill you all. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> it is all the life, Nelly. They have him. Let me get out of let me get at her! Come on, come on, this way, pal. She treated me very badly. She deserves to be punished. Okay, okay. Oh, get up! Oh, get up! Madam Alba, are you all right? Yes, Mr. Manager, I think so. Who was he? A lunatic escaped from a local asylum. I'm, I'm terribly sorry about this, madam. That's all right. It wasn't your fault. Shall we go on with the performance now? Do you feel that you can? I feel that I must. Uh, how about Mr. Duras? Well, Jean? If you are willing to sing again, Nelly, so am I. Why, that's wonderful. I, I'll, I'll make an announcement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen. We regret this most unfortunate interruption. It was caused by circumstances quite beyond our control. However, Madame Elber and Mr. Durask have very generously offered to continue the opera despite the great shock they've undoubtedly had. The performance will be resumed immediately. <laughs> We'd better go back to the beginning of the duet. Will you tell the conductor, Jean? Uh, monsieur, to the beginning of the duet, if you please. I'm ready, good. Come on. Ready, Nelly? Yes, I'm ready. Shh. Right, shh. Quiet, please. Shh. Keep the
Never felt better. <laughs> You're an amazing person. Chicago's an amazing city. I was told that anything could happen here and has certainly lived up to its reputation. I hope we don't have any more trouble when we come back here next January. You'll have plenty of traveling before then. What do we do in Philadelphia? Your first engagement is a concert at the City Hall. And one of your fellow artists is the new Italian tenor, Tamagno. And Mr. Tamagno, that you're going to sing with me during my next season in New York. You see, see, I was asked to come along and strengthen the company. It seemed strong enough to me. I have been told that the matter did not go so well. At the beginning of the season, there were difficulties, but we soon got over them. Ah, but now it will be all right, because this is the time you will have Tamagno. You're suggesting that this season wouldn't be a success without you? I leave that for the public to decide. Oh. Are you ready, madam? Yes, I'm coming. What are you singing? A number from the Pirates of Penzance, poor wandering one. <laughs> Such rubbish in music. Nothing of the kind. It's by Sir Arthur Sullivan. And it happens to be very good music. Take out a phrase, the 
Mr. Tamanio. Were you satisfied? You sang well enough. You don't think you'll be lowering yourself if you sing with me in New York? Madame Melba, let me tell you something. No matter how badly you sing, it will make no difference. Tamanio will be the star. Tamanio will fix everything. In just a few moments, we'll return to the Melba story. The Melba Story. Mr. Tamanio, it's actually your opinion that you'll be the star of our next New York opera season? But of course. Who else is there to compare with me? Well, there are other singers who enjoy a certain amount of popularity. Even I, for instance. Ah, uh, but you are not a tenor. <sighs> I have to admit to that. Everybody loves a tenor, and when the tenor is to Manio, with a top C which makes the chandeliers rattle. Can you actually do that? I'll prove it to you. No, 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 I, I believe you. And I'm sure you must have a very wonderful voice. You are most gracious. I kiss your hand. <clears throat> How would you like to come and lunch with me tomorrow? I should be enchanted. At one o'clock, then. I'll expect you. But, Nellie, if he's so insufferable, why did you ask him for lunch? So that we could have a good laugh. There he is. Open the door, Louis. Behold me. I am here. So I observe. Mr. Tamanio, isn't it? The great Tamanio. Oh, I beg your pardon. Nellie, the great Tamanio has arrived. How are you, my friend? So happy to be here, madame. And so hungry. When do we have lunch? Rather than have you die of starvation, Mr. Tamanio, we'll begin immediately. Louis, will you ring the bell? <laughs> These cutlets, mm, they are wonderful. Never have I tasted anything more delicious. Uh, what will become of the cutlets that are left? I really don't know. Do you, Louis? I expect they'll be thrown out. Thrown out? Oh, but what a waste. Uh, may I have a newspaper, please? A uh, newspaper? Uh, here's a copy of the New York Times. Oh, thank you, my dear. What are you going to do? I am going to wrap up these cutlets and take them home. You see, uh, my little dog, he loves uh, such delicacies. <laughs> I, I'll, uh, I'll get you some proper wrapping paper. I'll show you where it is, Louis. Will you excuse us, Mr. Tamanio? Certainly, certainly. <laughs> oh, oh, Louis. <laughs> Poor little man. <laughs> it's his little dog. <laughs> I don't believe he has a little dog. <laughs> let's let's open the door quietly and see what he's doing. Nelly, you'll never believe it. What? He's filling his pockets with everything there is on the table. I hope he leaves the knives and forks. <laughs> Come on, come on, we'd, we'd better go back. All right, but don't look at me, Louis, or I'll laugh right in his face. Ah, <coughs> oh, oh, ladies, you have a return. And the wrapping paper? Oh, I forgot. Uh, we, we couldn't find any. No matter, this newspaper will do. Oh. What a beautiful orchid you have in this room, madame. Oh, yes, I, I'm very fond of orchids. My, uh, my little daughter is ill. May I take some of these flowers for her? Your little daughter? She loves orchids so much. 
With your permission, madame, I will give these to her. With your compliments. I... I... And now I must go. Are you sure you haven't forgotten anything? No. No, I do not think so. Oh, that is a very beautiful dress you are wearing, madame. I'm sorry, Mr. Tamanio, but that's one thing I'm going to hang on to. How long do we stay in Washington, do we? Six hours, and then we leave for Pittsburgh. Then on to Cleveland, then Boston. What are you singing in Boston, Nelly? The Willow Song from Otello. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall sing for you the Willow Song from Verdi's Otello. It is sung by Desdemona as she prepares for bed, attended by her waiting woman, Emilia. Perhaps I should introduce it with the words of Shakespeare himself. My mother had a maid called Barbara. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it.
What's next, Louie? Chicago again. I'm sorry, madam, but the Melba suite isn't available. But I am Melba. You knew we were coming. Yes, but you see, there was another lady occupying the suite, and she refuses to move out. Perhaps she doesn't understand. Could I have a word with her? Well, I, I guess so. Yes, yeah, sure, I'll take you up right away. And Mrs. Stone, this lady is Madame Melba. Look, you're wasting your time. I'm not moving out for anyone. But this is the Melba suite. What does that mean? She doesn't own it, does she? No, but it was named in her honor. I can't help that. I've paid for this suite, and I'm staying right here. Oh, but Mrs. Stone... We'll only be in Chicago one night. Nothing doing. Never mind, Louis. We'll go somewhere else. But in future, I think you'd better call this the Stone Suite. Call it what you like, but it's mine right now. And if it's the Melba Suite, okay. I'm Melba. Are you sure she carries it, Jules, with her joke? Sure I am. I read about it in the papers. The Melba Collection. There's one bracelet she's got from the Tsar of Russia, diamonds and rubies, worth a fortune. Okay. Let's go in and grab it. What do you want? Are you Madame Melba? Suppose I am. Okay, Madam. Hand him over. And if you make one squawk, you get plugged. Chicago again lives up to its reputation, this time with jewel thieves. But what will happen when they learn that this is not Madame Melba? We'll learn that in the next intriguing chapter of The Melba Story. The Melba Story was written by John Ormiston Reed and produced by Dorothy Crawford. The Australian Symphony Orchestra was conducted by Hector Crawford. The role of Melba was spoken by Marcia Hart and sung by the Australian coloratura soprano, Glenda Raymond. <laughs>